All right. Um, we'll uh, we'll get started here. So it is uh, it's week six. It's Monday, um, and uh, I hope you guys are doing okay. Uh, thank you to everybody who responded to the um, kind of the mid survey or mid quarter questionnaire. Uh, I appreciate your responses. Um, uh, a lot of you just shared very personally, and, and I appreciate that, and I, I recognize that we are all uh, struggling a little bit uh, with this online format. And um, uh, yeah, so I'll take everything into consideration and, and think about that. Um, OK, here is, uh, I'm going to introduce um, the topic of classification, and we are going to look at the uh, the Bayes classifier. I did not finish the entire slideshow for the uh, the last class, for the 10 a.m. class, so uh, I probably won't finish them all today. Um, so we'll continue this topic on Wednesday, uh, but I think it'll, it'll be fine here. All right, so the idea with classification is that you've got um, training observations. Um, your training observations exist in d-dimensional space, you've got um, each observation has you know several measurements, and each of those objects, each observation, is associated with a particular class label. Okay, and then um, and so we've got I wrote there are c classes, and the goal is to predict um, the new class, the label, for uh, a new object, an unseen object x nu. Okay. So you had uh, a little bit of this in your um, in your homework where you had the iris data set. Okay, uh, your training objects were um, after you did your train test split. You would have 120 observations in your, or I think yeah, 120 observations in your training training data, and each of them had uh, was of dimension four. Okay, you had each training observation had four input values. You had pedal length, pedal width, sepal length, and sepal width. So you had four, um, uh, dimension four observation. And each of those objects um, had a class label, right? So it was either virginica or versicolor or setosa. Um, so you had these, um, you had a label, you had three labels. And the goal was, when you came across a new data point, okay, you have a new data point. Here's a new flower. Its petal length is eight. Its petal width is four. Its sepal length is three, and its sepal length is, or sepal width is two. Or I don't know. I'm making up numbers here. And given those four numbers, what, um, what do you predict it is? Do you predict that it's setosa, or do you predict that it's virginica? Okay. Um, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do classification here, okay? And so um, it's important to note that our class labels are integers. We, we write them as one, two, three, et cetera, but they are, uh, you have to treat them as categories. It would be wrong to um, say class label two is bigger than class label one or try to make a prediction of class label 2.5. That's just not gonna work, okay? Um, so today we're going to look at a one classification method called the Bayes classifier. Okay, and the Bayes classifier it's called that because it uses Bayes rule um, to find the probability that an observation belongs to a certain class. Okay, um, the Bayes classifier is a probabilistic classifier in that it returns a probability that you know observation your new observation is this class or your observation is this class. So it's going to return a probability. Um, it's similar to um, logistic regression in that it's probabilistic, okay, except logistic regression can only return, um, work with two classes, either the case that it is or the case that it's not, whereas the base classifier can work with multiple classes, okay. Uh, later on, we'll look at some hard classifiers, such as k-nearest neighbors and support vector machines. Um, it's important to note that this, the Bayes classifier is an application of Bayes rule, but it is not considered to be Bayesian statistics, okay? Um, 
Bayesian statistics is something I'll cover in 102C, but I could not here. All right, so just reviewing your rules from probability 100A, okay? Um, the probability of A given B, okay? This is just given probabilities. Bayes' rule says that the probability of A given B um, can be found as the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B, okay? So that's what, that's how we can calculate probability of A given B. So this is Bayes' rule. The numerator, probability of B given A times the probability of A is the same as the probability of B and A, or the intersection of B and A, okay? And then the bottom, probability of B, by the law of total probability, can be uh, decomposed into probability of B given A sub N times the probability of A sub N across uh, all possible values of A. So a lot of times we'll say that this is equal to the probability of B and A, A times the probability of A plus the probability of B given A complement times the probability of A complement, okay? Um, if, if you know this, the denominator, okay, this probability of B, which can be decomposed into this, is equal to the numerator if you sum it across all possible values of A. So if you take into account um, every possible value that A can take, this, uh, this is what we're going to have, okay? Um, I'm hoping this is all okay. This is uh, rules from uh, Stats 100A, right? Your probability rules, right? So I'm hoping this is all okay. All right, this is what we want to do. We want to um, get the probability, okay, t nu equals c. This is the probability, um, so this is the, I'm sorry, this is the probability we want. T, probability of t nu equals c given x nu and x t, okay? All right, what this is, this is the probability that a new class, new observation has a particular, belongs to a particular class, right? So what we're doing is here's a new flower, right? Here's a new flower. These are the four uh, measurements. Petal length is 10, petal width is nine, supple length is seven, supple width is three. Okay, I'm making those numbers up. Here's a new flower. What is the probability it is? Uh, we're gonna do C equals one. We're gonna, what's the probability it's Satosa, okay? What's the probability? We're gonna check it out for, C equals two, what's the probability it's versicolor? And then we're gonna do oh, C equals three, what's the probability that it's virginica, All right? So, so this is what we want, okay? Um, we wanna know what that probability given, you know, x nu, x nu are those four measurements, right? The four measurements, these are your four x measurements. Um, the petal length is 10, the petal width is nine, the sepal length is seven, the sepal width is six, or whatever, you know, whatever the numbers are, okay? So that's what we want, okay? This is, um, we wanna know the probability that class label T nu of some new observation is equal to some particular class label like Setosa or Virginica or Versicolor, okay? And then the, va the values uh, are in the input vector X nu, okay? And, um, and we have all the values in uh, the training data X and all the values in the, um, all the labels in the training data T, okay? So this is, we're gonna train our model using the training data and then uh, and everything here. Okay, so if I apply Bayes' rule, oh wait, hang on before I do that, um, we keep in mind that these are probabilities, so just the regular old probability rules are applied. Probability has to be between zero and one, uh, and then if you add up the probabilities across all possible classes, that's gonna have to add up to one, right? So um, if there's three classes, A, B, C, or in the case of the flowers, Setosa, Virginica, Versicolor, the three probabilities have to add up to one, right? So if it's Setosa with probability 0.19, or class A with probability 0.19, and class B with probability 0.8, and class C with probability 0.01, those three numbers have to add up to one, okay? Because it's, it's got to be one of those three classes, and so that's got to add up to one because it's uh, those cover all the possibilities. All right, 
Again, this is the probability that we want, t nu given, uh, t nu equals c given x nu, right? That's what we want this, uh, and we're gonna apply uh, Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule is a given b is equal to the probability of b given a times the probability of a divided by the probability of b. Okay, so this is gonna be probability of t nu equals c given x nu and x t, and Bayes' rule will say it's gonna be probability of x nu given t nu equals c times the probability of t nu equals c divided by the probability of x nu. These are all gonna get labels just so we can talk about each of these pieces separately and not to try to help us uh, remember what they what what we're talking about okay and so these are just labels you're going to have to kind of learn this part the thing that we're searching for is known as the posterior this is the probability we want to find it's the probability that your new observation given the values your new observed x values the color length whatever whatever observations uh, values you have Given those values, what is the probability it belongs to class C, okay? This uh, is gonna equal the, this part's the likelihood multiplied by this part, which is called the prior, and this part's called the marginal. So we're gonna do the likelihood times the prior divided by the marginal. The likelihood, this thing, x nu given t, t nu, this is the probability of getting your observed values if we assumed the new observation belonged to a specific class C. So what's the probability that the petal length is 10 and the petal width is 9 and the sepal length is 7 and the sepal width is 6 if it comes from Setosa? What's the probability of getting these four values if it comes from Virginica? What's the probability of these four values if it came from Versicolor? These are um, that's going to be the likelihood. The prior is a probability of some new observation belonging to some class before you know anything about the actual data value. So before I even look at the four data values, okay, what is the probability that the flower is Setosa or the probability that it's Virginica or the probability it's Versicola or in some other case, what's the probability it comes from class A? or class B or class C before I even look at the contents of the data, right? And that's gonna be the, the prior probabilities. That's gonna be, uh, just like everything else, everything's gonna be based on the training data that we see. And then the marginal in the denominator is the probability of observing the values, okay? Sepal length is this and sepal width and petal length and petal width, your, your X new values, Regardless of the class label, you want to find out what's the probability of observing these values, um, regardless of class label. Okay. Um, is this okay? Maybe I'll just pause here. Um, if, if this is okay, give me a green check mark. If this is not okay, um, let me know. All right. Uh, let me give you the first quiz answer. First quiz answer is going to be. Uh, B as in boy. I haven't created the quizzes on CCLE yet, so uh, um, just give me a moment uh, to do that after class. Um, but uh, but that will be the uh, the first quiz answer is B. All right. Are there any questions on this? Okay. Um, this is this is a lot of terms here. Okay, when we, um, when we do this, what we're gonna do is we're going to expand the denominator. Okay, we're gonna apply the law of total probability and um, we're gonna take advantage that all of the probabilities have to add up to one across all possible cl uh, classes. And so the denominator is going to be equal to the sum of the numerator across all possible classes. So we're gonna take this numerator and we're gonna look at every single possibility, okay? Um, and then we're gonna uh, add them all up, okay? So we're gonna say the probability of this numerator, sum of the numerator across all possible classes. So we're gonna have probability of x nu uh, given t nu times the probability of t nu. We're gonna do that for class one then we're gonna do it again for class two, 
I'm going to do it again for class three or however many classes you have, you're going to multiply them all and you're going to add them all up. Okay. Um, you can think of it as kind of a scaling, scaling factor, right? So if, if A is 0.1, B is 0.2, and C is 0.3, okay, if the numerator for class A is 0.1, and B, the numerator is 0.2, and C is 0.3, those add up to 0.6, and then so you're going to divide everything by 0.6 so that, um, so that the probabilities in, in total will add up, all add up to 1. All right. So I'm going to do a, a simple uh, example, and, um, and this will kind of establish the base classifier. And we're going to do this just for a kind of a univariate case, and then, um, and then we'll expand it to kind of a multivariate Gaussian, um, uh, which, and then we'll run out of time. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to start off here, and we're going to just say, um, this is a completely contrived example, but we're gonna say you decide to go online and you buy, say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy a whole bunch of marbles and I want them to come in little bags and you buy uh, 25 pouches, okay? 25 pouches of marbles um, and from some company, okay? And then when you arrive, the pouches, they come with labels and they go, oh, this pouch came from factory A. And then, uh, and then you've got a different pouch, and you say, oh, this pouch came from factory B. And it turns out there's three different factories, OK? And then uh, out of the 25 pouches you buy, 24 of them are labeled, and then one of them is not, OK? And what we want to do is we want to try to guess uh, which factory did this, uh, did this pouch come from, right? OK? Uh, in your shipment, half of the bags, the ones that are labeled, there's 24 that are labeled with the factory, half of them come from factory A. 12 out of 24 come from A. Uh, a fourth of them come from factory B, six out of 24. And a fourth of them come from factory C, okay? So, so half came from A, a quarter came from B, and a quarter came from C, and then one is unlabeled. And we're gonna try to guess what factory um, it came from. So I, don't know, this is, I look for a picture of pouches, and this is what we have. So we got 25 pouches. 24 of them are labeled. They are the training data. And then one is not labeled. This is going to be our test case. And we want to know, based on everything else we see in the training data, we, uh, we want to know what's, which, um, which group or which factory did this test case come from. So what we do is we go through uh, every single one of these pouches, okay? And we say, okay, for all the pouches that came from factory A, all right, uh, we go in and we look at the marbles. And for factory A pouches, 60% of the marbles are red, okay? And then you go through all the pouches for factory B, and then you look at them and you say, okay, well, you know, for the pouches that came from factory B, half of them are red. And then you do the same thing for factory C and you say 40% are red, okay? So we got 60% red, 50% red, and 40% red, okay? A is 60, B is 50%, and C is 40%, okay? Now, we don't know, we don't know the exact proportions um, at the factory, right? So as far as we know, the factories could all be pr producing 50% red, 50% blue, but um, but when they filled our pouches, you know, because of random error, we got something different. Or it could be that, you know, factory A is, you know, we don't know, but we're going to just assume that um, each factory uses a kind of a Bernoulli binomial process to fill them, that, that each marble that drops in is independently and randomly selected. And, and we're going to just go ahead and assume that our maximum likelihood estimates, be, we're going to say because in all of the pouches that came from factory A, 60% of our marbles are red, we're going to assume that factory A makes 60% red marbles, okay? Maybe that's not a good assumption. Maybe it's a little dangerous, but um, that's what we're going to assume. We're going to just say, because in my training data, 60% of my marbles are red for when they came from factory A, 
we're going to assume factory A makes 60% red. And then we're going to say, because in my training data, 50% of my marbles, for the marbles that come from factory B, 50% of them are red. We're going to assume that factory B makes 50% red marbles. Okay. Uh, and so we're going to, um, so our summary stats are also going to be our maximum likelihood estimates of the filling proportions based on the training data we observe. Okay. Does that kind of make sense there? We're just using what we observed in our data. We're going to just say, all right, for factory A, 60% of the marbles I saw were red. I'm going to just assume factory A makes 60% red marbles. Okay. A little bit dangerous, but, but it seems reasonable also, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a big assumption, but it also seems reasonable. All right, so we're going to take that and we're going to calculate the likelihood of our two new test case, right? So I open up the test case. I open it up. I dump out the marbles. Okay, there's 20 marbles and half of them, 10 out of the 20 are red, right? And so we say, okay, which factory did this bag come from, right? Factory A makes 60% red. Factory B makes 50% red. Factory C makes 40% red, okay? And when I open up my bag, I got 50% red. 10, 10 are red out of 20 marbles. So which, which factory did this come from? Okay, well, we're gonna calculate the likelihood, okay? The likelihood is the probability of getting your observed data, okay? What's the probability of getting 10 red marbles if we assume it belongs to a specific class, okay? So the likelihood it came from factory A is what's the probability I get 10 red marbles if, the pro uh, proportion of red is 0.6. So we're gonna do the binomial, we're gonna do 20 choose 10, 0.6 to the 10, 0.4 to the 10. And then for factory B is what's the probability of getting 10 red marbles if the filling proportion is 50% red, right? Factory B is 50% red. So we're gonna do 20 choose 10, 0.5 to the 10, 0.5 to the 10. And then factory C is gonna be, what's the probability of getting 10 red marbles if factory C is 40% red. So we do 20 choose 10, 0.4 to the 10, 0.6 to the 10, okay? And, uh, and so based on the likelihoods, factory B has the highest likelihood, which makes sense, right? Um, factory B is 50% red and I observed 50% red. So based on the likelihood alone, factory B has the highest likelihood, okay? Factory A and factory C are coincidentally equal because, uh, because of you know, 0.6 and 0.4 and, 2010, they're all kind of symmetric there. Um, here, we also want to incorporate the prior probabilities, okay? So before I opened up the bag, if somebody asked me, hey, don't look at what's inside the bag yet, but which factory do you think it came from, okay? What factory did this bag come from? Well, before you open up the bag, you're going to say, well, in my training data, well, what happened? In the training data, we had 24 bags that were labeled, and half of them came from factory A, right? So before I open the bag, it might be reasonable to say, you know what? There's a 0.5 probability this came from factory A, because in all the bags that I purchased, half of them came from factory A. So therefore, I believe this has a probability of 0.5 of coming from factory A, right? And then for all the bags that I purchased, you know, a four, quarter of them came from factory B. So maybe this has a 0.25 chance that it comes from factory B or, um, or a 0.25 chance that it comes from factory C. So those are my prior probabilities, okay? This, that's just based, so before I open up the bag, I'm just saying um, in my observed data that for the class labels go, you know, half are labeled A and a quarter are labeled B and quarter are labeled C. And so those are going to be my, my um, prior probabilities. Prior to opening the data, what's the probability that it belongs to class A or factor A is 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Okay, uh, let me just pause there again. Um, give me a green check mark if you understand where all of these numbers came from for the likelihoods and where all of these prior, num prior probability numbers come from, right? And if you got any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, make your uh, confusions or questions now.
Okay, and now I'll try to clarify things. All right, okay. Um, so, okay, most of you are giving me uh, green check marks, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, and, uh, and those of you who aren't responding, I hope, I hope it all makes sense. Um, okay, so I'm gonna keep going. So we got the likelihood, we got the prior, okay? And so uh, the likelihood multiplied by the prior is going to be our numerator, okay? So this is the likelihood, the probability of getting the observed value x, in this case, 10 red out of 20 marbles, that's the observed values in x, given that it comes from some class, factory A or factory B or factory C. And then we multiplied it by the pro prior probabilities, okay? And so here, this is the likelihood, this is the binomial. We multiply it by 0.5 for class A. Here's the binomial probability, 20 choose 10, blah, 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 multiplied by the prior probability for class B, okay, 0.25, and then the binomial probability multiplied by the prior probability 0.25 here, okay? And so these are, this is the value of the numerator, okay? So, um, well, what do we notice? We notice that for likelihoods, class B has the highest, and then for the prior probabilities, class A is the highest, right? So, Prior to looking at it, we would have said 0.5 times A, 0.25 for B, and 0.25 for C. From the likelihood alone, class B uh, is the highest, 0.176. It's a little bit lower, 0.117 and 0.117. And so we multiply those two together and we get these numbers, okay? 0.058 is A, which is the highest, 0.044, which is next for B, and 0.029, okay? And then basically what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these values and we're going to scale accordingly, okay? And so we're going to take, we're going to add up all of the numerator values. So this is the numerator value calculated across all three classes, and we're going to add them up. So we're going to take those three numbers and we're going to add them up, and this is going to form our denominator. And this will basically scale everything so that the results will add up to one, okay? So we're going to just, so our denominator is just take the numerators, and add them up, okay? And you take the three numerator values, okay? The new value of the numerator across all three classes, you get 0 0.1319. And, uh, and basically I take class A and I divide by that number 0 0.1319, okay? So the total probability, the posterior probability, which is what we're going for, is, you know, we apply Bayes' rule and and so the probability that it belongs to class A, given the data that we saw, 10 red out of 20 is going to equal the probability, the likelihood of getting 10 red if class A is probability 0.6 and prob prior probability of factory A is 12 out of 24 or 0.5. And then we divide this across getting 10 red regardless of factory, which is just the sum of the numerators across all classes. Okay, and when I do that, I get 0. 0.444, okay, something around 0. 0.444. Um, I do this for class B and class C. I take my class B numerator divided by the sum of all the numerators, and I get 0. 0.334. And then for class C, I get something around 0. 0.222, okay? So it's interesting, all right, if, again, if we were to look only at the likelihoods, right? So our data that we saw was half red, 0.5 red. And if we took that into consideration only, we would have picked factory B because factory B is 0.5 red, whereas factory A is 0.6 and factory C is 0.4. So those are a little bit less likely to produce half red, okay? But then if you take in the prior probabilities, the prior probability said um, A is most likely because out of the 24 bags, 12 of them were red, so A is most likely. And B is not as much likely because out of the 24 bags, only six of them came from factory B. But then um, but what happens is when you combine them, okay, um, the, the, hi, the high pro, prior probability of factor A, factory A kind of combines with the likelihood 
and then you uh, get that do the same for factory B and factory C and the overall outcomes is that factory A is the most probable at 0.44 which is a little bit lower than its prior probability. Before looking at the bag it was 50% red probability. After look, opening up the bag and seeing it was only 50.5 red lowered that probability down to 0.44. Okay. Prior to looking at the bag class B had a probability of only one, one out of four, six out of 24 here, one out of four. But then after opening it up, and we see that the bag was 50% red, which matches what factory B produces, this probability goes up to 0.33, okay? And then factory C, which used to be 0.25 um, probability, after opening up the bag, its probability goes down a little bit to 0.22. So that's how we do those calculations. Okay. Um, there were some big assumptions that we made. Okay. The two biggest assumptions were that the MLE estimates from our training data, we just applied to the factories. We said, you know, when I received my bags, okay, and I opened up all the factory A bags, 60% of the marbles were red. Therefore, I'm assuming the factory makes 60% red marbles. Is that a good assumption? It's a reasonable assumption. It's reasonable, but that it's also a big assumption, right? Because um, the marbles that you see are just a, a random sample, right? And we know that random samples are subject to variance. And so um, it's possible that factory A has a higher proportion red or lower proportion red. Right now we're just saying, because in my data, 60% of the marbles are red when they came from factory A, we're gonna assume factory A produces 60% red marbles. And we did that for all the factories. So that's a big assumption, okay? Uh, we assumed our MLE estimates are the propor um, proportions that apply to the population. Okay, and then the other big assumption was that in my training data, half of the bags came from factory A. And therefore I said for the prior probabilities, there's a prior probability that it comes from factory A with probability 0.5, okay? Also a big assumption, okay? Um, you might have domain-specific knowledge, right? You might have knowledge of the system and the process, and you might say, well, I know that factories A, B, and C each produce uh, annually the same number of bags, okay? And so overall, the probability that it comes from A or B or C is just one-third. Okay, maybe you know that, okay? Um, we don't know that, right? So, so we did, I think, a reasonable assumption, which says, you know, for the data that I observed, half of the bags came from factory A, therefore I'm gonna assume factory A produces half the bags, okay? It's, it's a, again, that's a big assumption, but it's a reasonable one. So, um, but depending on the situation that you're in or the domain knowledge you have, you might say, you know what? I know better, uh, and I'm going to model the prior probabilities as one third each. Okay, so that's that's also reasonable. So let me do uh, the same example, but we're going to just say let's let's say we had a different test case. Okay, so we have a new test case. All right, so this time when I open up the bag, out of 20 marbles, only six of them are red. Okay. So um, only 30% of the, this new test case is red. So which factory did this one come from, okay? Well, for this, we can calculate the likelihood multiplied by the prior. So we're gonna use the same prior probabilities. So we're gonna say factory A has prior probability of 0.5 and factory B prior probability of 0.25 and 0.25 for factory C. But then when we apply the likelihoods, we can see this is where it makes a difference. We can say, if it came from factory A, factory A has a probability of being 0.6 red, okay? And my bag ended up only being 0.3 red. Only six out of the 20 marbles ended up red. So, you know, how often is that gonna happen? It's not gonna happen very often. Excuse me. Um, it's possible, but it's not gonna happen very often, right? Whereas factory C, Factory C produces red marbles 
uh, with a probability of 0.4, okay? So the fact that I only got six out of 20 being read, okay, a pro proportion of 0.3, that doesn't seem all that unreasonable, right? It doesn't seem all that unlikely. So if you tell me that, you know, um, by random chance, we would expect around eight red marbles and we only got six this time, we go, okay, yeah, we, we're a little shy, but it's not that weird, right? So, so based on the likelihoods, factory C becomes uh, a lot more likely when we do 22 to the six, 0.4 to the six, and 0.6 to the 14, okay? So when you do that, you see class A has the lowest probability of 0 0.00, uh, oh, this is not a probability, this is uh, the numerator, um, the likelihood times the prior. And so, um, the, but that comes in the lowest at 0 0.002, and then class C is the highest at 0 0.03. So we add all of these up, we add up the numerators, this value, this value, and this value, which is here, here, and here. We add up the numerator across all possible values, and we get what we're going to use for the denominator. And so when we do that, Class A has a probability of around 5 or 6%, and Class C has a probability of around 72, 73%, 73%. And so we can see in this case, because my the data that I look at inside the pouch is very unlike what Class A should be. Class A says it should be 60% red, and my pouch is only 30% red. Because there's such a stark difference, Class A becomes very unlikely with around probability of around 6%, and Class C becomes a lot more likely with a probability of around 73%. Okay, and, uh, and so this, um, this sums all of that up. Is that okay? All right, let me um, introduce. Uh, the mixtures of multivariate Gaussians, and then we'll, um, we'll we're going to run out of time, but uh, but we'll start here, and then we'll uh, we'll finish this up on Wednesday. Okay, so the multivariate normal distribution looks like this. Okay, this is the PDF of the multivariate normal distribution, and um, there's actually a, a lot of overlap between. Uh, it's very similar. So here is the normal distribution PDF, okay? And if you look at the normal distribution PDF and the multivariate normal PDF, they're, they're quite similar. I've got 1 over root 2 pi, and here in d dimensions, you're going to have 1 over 2 pi raised to the d over 2. So if d is 1, you're going to have 1 over square root 2 pi. And then for d being other values, it's going to take on, um, you know, it's going to be d over root 2. Um, here we've got the standard deviation sigma, which is also equal to the square root of the variance. And here basically I have the square root of the determinants of the variance here. Okay, and that, that goes right here. And then I have e raised to, for the normal, I've got e raised to the negative one half x minus mu over sigma quantity square. And for the multivariate normal, I got e raised to the negative one half, and then um, pretty much the equivalent of x minus mu over sigma uh, squared. I've got uh, x minus mu transpose x minus mu, which is pretty much x minus mu squared, okay, for in vector form. And then divide by uh, basically six sigma squared is going to be, um, we're multiplying by the um, inverse of the sigma matrix, okay. So lo lots of parallels there. Um, in this case, uh, your x is a vector in d-dimensional space, in d-dimensional space, okay? And mu is a vector of means, okay? It's also going to be a length d vector. And, um, and each component in there is going to be the mean um, element x sub d, okay? The variance sigma is a d by d variance covariance matrix, okay, of the uh, x variables. Um, if sigma is diagonal or all, all the off diagonal elements are zero, then the x variables are independent of each other. There's no covariance between them. And the multivariate PDF can actually be factored into the product 
of univariate uh, Gaussian PDS. Okay, so that's kind of a, uh, a neat thing you can do. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate some data, and then we're going to, um, what we want to do is we want to predict the class of some test cases. Okay, so, um, so to simulate it, our data, I'm going to load up the library uh, multivariate norm, MVT norm, okay? Set a random seed, okay? And so to generate data, I, I use R multivariate norm. So rather than R norm, okay, I use R multivariate norm. And then just like R norm, you specify how many data points you want, uh, the mean and the standard deviation, okay? Except this time, because we're in um, a higher dimensional space, your mean has to be a vector and your standard deviation or your uh, variance matrix has to be, uh, your variance has to be a matrix, okay? So we're gonna simulate two-dimensional multivariate data. So my mean is a vector of length two, okay? So, so the mean is gonna be centered at two comma three. And then my sigma is gonna be a matrix, a two by two matrix, because I've got two variables. It's, this one is diagonal, it's three zero zero one. Um, class B will be centered at the origin, okay, and its uh, matrix is going to be the uh, identity matrix, a two by two identity matrix, okay, and again, each thing is being uh, generated using uh, RMV norm, mu and uh, sigma, and then uh, class C is centered at two, negative two, and this one has covariance, 2.5 and 2.5 for its covariance. Okay, I'm gonna, um, so I have got three matrices. Each one is 30 rows and two columns. Okay, and then I'm gonna combine them all into matrix X, which will have then 90 rows and two columns. Uh, and then here is, uh, this is, I'm gonna plot these, okay? And so this is just some code to plot them along with um, the ellipses, which show the contour lines of the generating distributions, okay? And so here um, I colored them according to their class. I've got red dots and blue dots and green dots. And the question, well, um, later on we're gonna add a test case and we wanna know based on the location of the test case, which class do we think this belongs to, okay? So these are the red dots, the blue dots, and the green dots. The ellipses represent kind of contour lines of the generating distribution, okay? So uh, the multivariate normal distribution looks like uh, ellipses, okay? And here, this one is centered at two comma three, and, um, and the size of these circles represent kind of the, uh, the variances, okay? This, uh, the blue dots come from a gener distribution centered at zero comma zero, right? And we can tell that the blue dots and the red dots, their generating distributions are independent because the major and minor axes of these ellipses, um, the major and minor axes are perpendicular or are parallel to the x and y axes. Okay. Whereas this generating distribution for class C is um, does not have independent um, the x and y variable x1 and x2 x whatever the, the, the x variables are not independent so the major and minor axes are um are not parallel to the x and y axis they are the, it's it's kind of off kilter here okay so what are we going to do what we want to do is we want to be able to label the a new test point okay unfortunately i have these you know pretty uh lines here from our generating distribution, but in real life is that we don't actually know the generating distribution. We don't know the population mean and the population variances, okay? We know them here because we generated them ourselves, but in real life, we wouldn't know that, okay? So when we do the exercise, we're gonna have to say, I don't know what the population mean is. I don't know what the uh, population variance is, okay? And so we're going to estimate. We're gonna estimate the mean and the variance, okay? We estimate the mean by basically taking the mean uh, mean vector for each class, okay? So here it just says add up the x vectors and divide by n, okay? And these have a subscript C to indicate that we're only doing it for one particular class, okay? So in our case, 
these are convenient, our data is already conveniently divided. I've got um, XA, which is just the observations that belong to class A. Okay, 30 rows, two columns. I'm going to just ask for the column means. I'm going to ask for the mean of column one and the mean of column two. And that, uh, that gives me this, right? So in the generating distribution, the, um, the mean is 2 comma 3, and the means are 0 comma 0 and 2 negative 2. And here I'm estimating them based on my data. And so it's not quite 2 comma 3. I get 2.26 and 2.82. Um, the real values are 2 and 3. And the real values are jet for the generating distribution is 0 and 0, but here I get something a little bit different, 0 0.3 and negative 0.1. And then for class C, the generating distribution is 2, negative 2, and I get something a little bit off, okay? Because these are random samples, and, and I'm getting values estimated based on 30 observed points. For the uh, variance, the maximum likelihood estimate is this, okay? X minus mu transpose X minus mu uh, divided by N. But um, that's going to be biased, and so the unbiased estimate is just going to be the variance, the sample variance matrix, okay? Uh, which is going to basically be the same thing, but divided by n minus 1. And so I can do that for my data. Again, I have um, 30 observations in XA, 30 by 2. I just say, what's the uh, variance of that matrix? I get a 2 by 2 matrix. What's the variance of my 30 observations in um, class B? And I get a 2 by 2 matrix. And what's the variance of my observation in class C? And I get a 2 by 2 matrix. And so um, if I graph those contour lines, um, I, get, I get these ellipses, okay? Which looks very similar to the uh, previous one, but we notice a few things, right? So here, when I take my sample variance matrix for class A, um, when we generated them, they all had covariances of zero, but here I'm getting a little bit of covariance, okay? Not, it's not zero, it's, uh, it's a little bit, it's not zero. And so you can see that because the major and minor uh, axes of these ellipses, ellipses are not parallel to the x and y axis, right? It's not, uh, it's not, yeah, it's not completely parallel. It's just a little bit angled. And uh, and you can also see this. These um, in the generating distribution for class B, we had concentric circles because they had equal variances. And here they're not quite circles; they're a little bit off. Okay. And so if I compare the generating distributions to the estimated contours, we get something a little bit different. We get something a little bit different, okay? But we're going to have to use these because we, in real life, we don't know the, the real contours. We don't know the true generating distributions. If we did, it, our life would be easier. But here we just have to estimate them based on the observations we've seen, okay? Um, and what, then what we're going to do next is we're going to say, here's a test case. Based on this test case, which class does it belong to? Okay, uh, here's a, another picture. Here's another test case. Does this belong to class, the red class or the green class? Is this class A, B, or C? Is this class A or B, uh, B or C? Okay. Um, what about this one? Is this A, B, or C? Uh, what about this one? Is this A, B, or C? Okay, depending on... If you observed a new data point right here, how would you label this? Would you label this red, blue, or green? Okay, um, and that's uh, that's what we'll look at. Okay, we'll look at that on on Wednesday. Um, we'll calculate each of these things. Right, this one's going to be easy. Right, if you see a data point here, you're going to label it class B. You're going to label it blue. Okay, but the other ones are a little bit uh, a little bit harder, and um, and so we'll uh, we'll take a look at the calculations that go in there, um, and then I'll uh, do the uh, naive Bayes classifier, which is very similar to the Bayes classifier, but it brings in a naive assumption, and then um, and then we'll look at a, a little application there. So, all right. Uh, oh, second quiz. Second quiz answer is B. Second quiz answer is B. Um, and, uh, and give me a minute to uh, create the quizzes on uh, CCLE in the first place. So um, I haven't done those yet. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll end here. Uh, yes, B as in boy, B as in boy and bear.
beats Battlestar Galactica. I don't know. There's a B, B as in boy. So uh, that is the second quiz answer. Um, all right, and that's it. Okay, so we'll see you guys on Wednesday, and um, we'll see you then.